Welcome, my name is Bridget Arend and I'll be sharing with you course design models and shared principles. Even though we're educational developers, overall we rarely are provided with a strong background in course design. And most faculty members are given little if any background in course design models as well. So for us to best support our faculty in their teaching practice, it's helpful for us to not only have some familiarity with notable course design models, but also to be able to advocate for and apply the ideas and principles that are common among these models. So this module will provide an overview. You'll also have the opportunity to reflect on your own course design knowledge and experience to make the most of these ideas. Many scholars in this area have argued that there are some common approaches we take to designing courses in higher education. We can be very content-centered in that we focus on the material and the information that we need to cover. There's also an approach that might be considered activity-centered, where we think about the types of teaching methods that we want to use, but most scholars would argue that what we really want is a learning-centered approach, where we focus on the desired learning outcomes that we have for our students at the end of the course. And from there, we decide on the activities and the content that are necessary. Feel free to pause this video and reflect on the following questions. How have you and your faculty designed courses in the past, and how would you describe effective course design before we move on? You can click play again when you're ready. What are some foundational course design models in higher education in the United States? I'm going to talk about two very well-known and cited models. Grant Wiggins and Jay McTighe have a book called Understanding by Design, and Dee Fink has a model called Integrated Course Design. Now the Wiggins and McTie model is really where we get this idea of backward design in higher education. This idea is where we start with our learning goals. We focus on what we want students to have learned by the end of a course. And then from there, we design our course assessments. And from there, we determine what kinds of activities and materials are necessary in order for students to do well on those assessments, which would then mean that they met the learning goals. Another big contributor to course design models is the idea of integrated course design, which was designed originally by L.D. Fink in his book, Creating Significant Learning Experiences. This also includes the taxonomy of significant learning. And in Fink's approach, he is known with starting what he calls the big dream for student learning. This is where we not only think of what we want students to have by the end of the course, but even think further out five years down the road, even after they've graduated, what is it that we hope and dream for our students? This approach also focuses on holistic learning that goes beyond just the content in the course. That's where the taxonomy of significant learning comes in handy. Now, if you're from other parts of the world, especially Europe, you might be familiar with Biggs Constructive Alignment Framework. This is very similar to the ones I've just described in that it focuses on backward design, long-term learning goals, and this alignment of our activities and our assessments. There's also a lot of work that has been done in the training and the learning and development world, where tying instruction to specific learning outcomes is very helpful. You may run across frameworks out there, such as the ADDIE model. ADDIE stands for Design Stages of Analysis, Design, Development, Implementation, and Evaluation. There's also the Keller Arcs model, Agile development, which is really more of an iterative approach to course design. And then there's the, the more popular idea of design thinking, which again, isn't necessarily a course design model, but contributes to our ideas of empathy, of getting to know the end user of our design, which in our case is our students, and some ideas of ideation and rapid prototyping. And I also want to make sure to touch on some related ideas and concepts that are not necessarily course design models in themselves, but are very important and very much overlap with best practices in course design. Universal Design for Learning is a very popular framework. This can help us in our course design by helping us look for things like providing multiple modes of instruction or multiple ways for students to demonstrate learning and ways to make sure our courses are accessible for all learners. Related to this is the idea of culturally responsive pedagogy. This is somewhat of an umbrella term that represents ideas and practices and frameworks for being inclusive in our teaching and for providing culturally responsive and relevant educational experiences. 
Sasha Costanza Chalk has a book called Design Justice, and Design Justice is an emerging set of ideals. It goes well beyond just higher education, but it's a collection of ideas that intentionally center the voices that have often been left out of the design processes, for example, left out of our courses or of our curriculum. And it aims to prioritize the impact of the design process on the people that it impacts over the process itself or even the person that designs it. Many of these concepts and frameworks, although they've come from different spaces, have common design principles. So it may not be important to know them by name, but as an educational developer, it can be very useful to understand these principles. Common among all these frameworks are the ideas of backward design and alignment. I mentioned backward design before. It's not really a backward process at all. It's simply the idea that you start with the end in mind. You start by thinking of the kind of learning you want students to achieve by the end of a course, and then you back that up to think through what needs to happen when to achieve these goals. Once you've identified your learning outcomes, you next think about the learning assessments. This is where the process feels a little backwards to some folks, but this is where we think about how will we know that the students have learned what we want them to learn and how will the students themselves know where they are in that process? And then we think about the activities that are necessary in order to help students be successful at those learning assessments, which would then mean that they've achieved the learning outcomes. This very much overlaps with the idea of alignment. Alignment is this process of matching our goals and our assessments and our activities so that we're using our own time and energy as well as the time and energy of our students as valuably as possible. And we also can think about alignment beyond our course to our program goals, our college or institutional goals, or even external goals that we may have for broader alignment. Beyond the principles of backward design and alignment is the idea of long-term learning goals. Although course design often focuses on what we want students to learn by the end of a course, most of these processes also think about what we want for students more broadly, more holistically. What impact can this course have on these longer term goals for students? These are the concepts of enduring questions from Wiggins and McTie, or the six domains of Fink's significant learning taxonomy that can help us get beyond immediate content and help us focus on more long term knowledge, long term learning, application skills, thinking and writing skills, metacognition, habits or practices of our disciplines, but are often these things that are very much ongoing processes. And we want to build inclusion into our courses from the very beginning, inclusion by design. We want relevance, we want belonging for our students, and we can try to design that into our course from the beginning as much as possible. We can articulate our own assumptions, look at our own biases. We can include additional voices and perspectives in the process, whether that's diversifying course materials or looking at the activities that we use or don't use for accessibility and for creating a sense of community in our courses. We should think through how to make our courses relevant and effective for everyone and also building in the flexibility necessary to make that happen. So that's very related to the final principle here of learning-centered inquiry-based practices. The focus here is not so much on the content or the instructor or even the activity as much as it's about the learning. Allowing for self-assessment and choice or open inquiry into topics. We want inquiry-based practices where the students are actively involved in their own learning, where they can take ownership of their own learning. We have another opportunity here to pause and reflect on the following questions. How do these common elements support what you already know about effective course design? What ideas are new to you? And what do you want to learn more about? Feel free to pause the video here and hit play again when you're ready. To wrap up, why is course design important? Defink would argue that course design is the missing element in faculty preparation. We often go into a faculty role with strong content knowledge and even some background, at least by experience of being a student and what happens in the classroom. But most faculty have very little, if any, experience or foundational knowledge in course design. That's one area that can make a huge difference in the learning of our students. 
Wiggins and McTighe would argue that it's because good design makes it more likely by design that students will achieve the learning outcomes. We will still need to work on our facilitation. We still have many other things to do in our classrooms to create supportive and inclusive learning environments. But if we have strong design, it's much more likely that most of our students will achieve most of the learning goals we have for them.